This is the Stuckat home service. Hey guys, welcome back to Pastcast, the podcast where I, Paula Peterson, peer back at the posthumous podcasts of the previous historical period before this peaceful paradise. This week, a pandemic special coming to us direct from the year 20. Guys! Why? It's the dog! It's the dog! I'm sorry, I I apologize for this. This is not professional. Um, ignore that. Sorry. My, uh, I'm being interrupted by my robo dog and my brother, so, uh, let's take that again. Hey guys, welcome back to Pastcast, the podcast where I, Paula Peterson, peer back at the posthumous podcasts of the previous historical period before this peaceful paradise. This week, a pandemic special coming to us direct from the year 2020, a hundred years in the past. This is the Stuck at Home Service, a public service broadcast from Pittsmoor, Sheffield, in a place that used to be called England. Now, for those of you who might be unaware, a pandemic is a period of extreme illness spread, which, of course, is the sort of thing that used to happen before our benevolent robot overlords took over and people still suffered from things such as disease and mortality. The Stuck at Home service is the creation of Martin and Frankie Curry. Now, Frankie Curry is a name that is going to be familiar to all of you, I'm sure. Martin, perhaps less so. He is, in fact, the father of this infamous historical figure. And before events occurred, they did such things as the Stuck at Home service in an effort to spread community spirit and cheer people up in their neighbourhood in this time of intense disruption. The show always started with their alternative national anthem, so let's go straight to that. another wonderful rendition of a new national anthem by Kate Thomason, friends. Inspiring stuff, isn't it, Martin? It's the same bloody rendition we always have. It's a recording. You know what, Martin? That idea of, like, recordings and stuff like that has really, like, gotten me thinking recently. Like, you're in a good mood. Oh, fabulous mood, Martin. I like, when you're in a good mood. Because I've been, I've been thinking. It's like, what, we're up to, like, seven, eight episodes now? Up to seven episodes, yes. You know that if you're if you're to listen to them. Well, I don't need to, Martin, because, like, I understand what this podcast is really about. It's about setting a historical record so that people in the future can look back to mine and, of course, your example. I realise how bloody irritating you are when you're in a good mood. We're not just like podcast hosts, Martin. We're, I want to kill we're, you. We're, we're historical legends. Me and you. Well, a remarkable prescience from the younger Curry there. Um, if only he could have had the same foresight about the serial wars, then countless deaths could have been avoided. Anyway, to the next segment. Um, we're going to, so we're going to introduce items. What's the next item? Well, Martin, uh, our next intro is uh, by Ben Boardman, our board game correspondent. I remember him. Oh, this is the this is the Snakes and Ladders game. Um, yes, uh, I, I believe um, uh, Boris Johnson is one point ahead. I believe he's at square twenty on on the board. Hi there, Ben Boardman here, resident board game geek for the Stuck at Home service. If you were listening last week, you'd have heard the first part of a recording I made of a game of snakes and ladders between our glorious leader, Boris Johnson, and Caroline Lucas, she of the Green Party. This week, I'm going to play you the second and concluding part. Just to remind you, no one was allowed to say anything. 
we messaged one another on a WhatsApp group. They used the John Lewis set. Caroline had a green counter, and Johnson had, naturally, a blue one. They ended the first part with Caroline on square 19 and Johnson on square 20. So if you've got a John Lewis set handy and you want to follow the game at home, set it up now. Caroline is the first to go. She's thrown a two. Mm, she's not doing so well after her flying start. Or perhaps I should say her eco-friendly fast train start. Anyway, she's on square 21. Johnson's go. He's thrown a five, which takes him to 25. He's safe there, but he's got a snake in front of him, but also a ladder. Caroline throws a five and moves to square 26. So she's got a snake and ladder in front of her as well. Johnson's rolled a three. He landed on the snake and goes back to number ten. He's messaged, back where I belong, grinning face. Let's see if Caroline can get past the snake and land on the ladder. She has. She's rolled a four. And the ladder takes her up to 52. Johnson's thrown a five, which takes him to the ladder at 15, and up he goes to 72. Caroline's messaged, I hope you're not going to pull that ladder up now you're at the top of it, stern face. Caroline's thrown a four, taking it to 56, just avoiding the snake at 55. Another six from Johnson. That takes him to 78. He's messaged, 78, the size of my majority, ha ha. Only because our electoral system is outdated and unfair, like everything else about you. Mm. A bit severe from Caroline. Johnson's ignored her and rolled again, and it's another six. He's on 84 now, and there's a message from Caroline. I doubt you can maintain your sudden spurt. Mm. She's not the first woman to say that. And she's right. He can't maintain his spurt. He rolled a one. So he's on square 85. Caroline's got a bit of catching up to do, though. Oh, she's thrown a five. That takes her to the ladder at square 61 and up to 82. Well, that's closed the gap. Johnson's only 15 from winning. He's got a ladder to help him. But then there are two snakes. His turn again. He's rolled another one. He's still only on square 86. Caroline's thrown a four. They're neck and neck on 86. Johnson's messaged, fancy a coalition, zucchini emoji. Hmm, I don't think he's inviting her around to his allotment. She's replied, not on your Nelly, angry face. Johnson's rolled a four. That takes him to the ladder at square 90, which takes him up to 93. Only seven squares to go but still two snakes to get past, and one of them is the longest on the board. Over to you, Caroline. She's thrown a three, so she's still behind. Square 89. Johnson rolls. It's a one, so he's not much further on, and still those snakes to get past. He's on square 94. Caroline's thrown a six. She's on 95. She can win the game with her next roll. Or she could go down one of those snakes. And it's a... Uh, two. She's past the first one. She's on 97. Johnson's thrown a five. He's past both snakes. And he's on square 99. He only needs a one to win. He's messaged... Phew... All these snakes remind me of a Tory leadership contest. Relieved face. Caroline's messaged, You're not out of the woods yet, and our policy is to plant more trees. Hmm, what's she going to roll? It's a five. She moves three forward to the finish square, but then she has to go back two to 98. And there's a snake there. Down she goes to 60. Hmm, no message from Johnson. He knows the same could happen to him, or worse. And it has. 
He's thrown a five. So he goes forward one and back four to 96 and down the longest snake on the board to number 33. Caroline's in with a real chance now. Oh, Johnson's messaged, I am undaunted. Elephant emoji. Caroline's turn. Oh, I think I heard something then. Ah, Johnson's had a text. He's messaged, sorry to spoil the fun, but there's a vote in Parliament. And we've got a three-line whip. Sad face, happy face. You won't want to miss that, Caroline's messaged. Winking face. Hmm, it doesn't look as if they'll be able to finish this game. Affairs of state and all that. Well, I hope that did a bit of boredom busting. Pity they couldn't finish the game. We'll never know if Caroline would have been happy with being first past the post. Or if Johnson's learnt how fast and how far you can fall when you come across a particularly long snake. If you'd like to finish the game at home, I'll just recap where they ended. Johnson was on square 33 and Caroline was on number 60. I was Ben Boardman and that was Boardman's Board Game Boredom Buster. Don't forget to tune in to the Stuck at Home service every week and I'll have more boredom busting banter for you soon. Now, this is an absolutely fascinating piece because, of course, Ben Boardman is a name that gets thrown around a lot, but he is an incredibly mysterious figure. We don't know if it was an alias or whether he was an actual person, but regardless of who he was, he has had an incredible impact on our lives today because, of course, our now favourite pastime, board game spectating, did come out of the great lockdown of 2020, and Ben Boardman was an incredibly influential figure at this time, and perhaps, dare I say it, a hero? Anyway, that's enough from me. Here are the curries once again. Well, Martin, that was a fantastic bit of commentary there from Ben Boardman. Yes, it was. Have you heard it? No, no, of course not. What's Martin, happening next then? Martin, historical figures such as I and perhaps you don't need to pay attention to the things happening around them as they're going to be important to the people in the future. Right, okay. I keep myself planted in the now okay. in that I don't look at it at all and just absorb... Just importance well, and like the, so, the so decadence you, you, of the you age. You want me to introduce the next article because you've no idea what it is. Absolutely, Martin. I love okay. how you're on the same wavelength as me. <laughs> okay, uh, this is a this is a, an item I'm considering calling uh, in, in 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 the same boat. We had two beekeepers a couple of weeks ago. We had uh, the the fabulous uh, Joanne and Kate who have adult disabled children last week, and uh, this week I've got two uh, midwives. Um, so uh, they've obviously got something in common let's hear what they've got to say to each other This is Ali Salmon and Alison Norris It's always unpredictable Yeah, I think I mean, I do love it I think that is the biggest stress for me is when we're short of staff mm. um, I mean I started, when did I start? Eight years ago um, It was worse then Yeah. Um, sometimes I remember running the dress up on, uh, on seven of us on Labour Ward and um, uh, it's supposed to be 13 now they reckon yeah um, they they did a, they did a, a measurement didn't they over about a year I think of the number of people we had and the level of risk uh-huh you know how complicated people were yeah um, and that made them uh, that gave them a strong argument to increase the staffing and then they did yeah so I think on labor ward it's better but it's a bit like a and E, you just mm. never know what's coming through the door, and things can just, you know, throw you, can't they? And and suddenly you haven't, you've got to find more staff from somewhere. You've got to be a bit of an adrenaline junkie, I think, to enjoy midwifery, because you really don't know. Like you can sometimes you answer a buzzer and it's simply how do I get a jug of fresh water? Sometimes you answer a buzzer and it's ah okay. I'll get some help in here because yeah. we, we're going to need to move pretty quick, you know. Mm. And you just don't know. No, no. And, and did you did you realise that before you trained? And did you think that that was something you would enjoy? I don't think I did really realise it. Um, what did I... I mean, the bit I've always loved, and I think because I did teaching of one kind and another before, uh-huh. um, it is that 
helping people do things they really didn't think they could do. Yeah. I've I've had a couple of women, especially especially with first babies, but sometimes if they've had a bit of a traumatic delivery with the first and then the second goes differently, mm. you know, turn around to me and say, I didn't think I could do that. Yeah. And I love that. When something like that happens, I think, oh yeah, that 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 really makes it worthwhile. Mm. Yeah. And really almost every birth narrative has a point like that in it doesn't it you know it, yeah. it's, it's part of the, the process isn't it that you get to a point where you think you can't go on uh, or the woman does and um, mm. you know that's exactly the point as midwives we get quite excited and think right <laughs> things are going to happen yeah. here <laughs> but you know it, it's a it's it can be quite a horrible position to be in um, for the for the woman and for her partner you can manage almost anything if people, if you're doing it together, like, and what, what what's going on and what the options are. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and a bit like um, you talked about the adrenaline, being an adrenaline junkie. Mm. I suppose some people are, are better at keeping calm and able to keep that communication going. Mm. And... Um, other people become very fo- task focused, don't they? And yeah. um, I suppose the sort of the, the perfect combination for a midwife is someone who can who can keep calm and still communicate despite everything that's going on. I say to women, we're just the stabilizers on the back of the bike in case something goes a bit wobbly, you know. Um, so a lot of time, that's mostly what we are, you know, that encouragement and. Um, and just keeping a weather eye out. One time, I just thought, you're getting really tired. And I thought, well, what can I give her to eat that's got energy in it? That Because obviously, when you're in labour, often you don't want to eat very much. Yeah. Because you're, you're, you're oxytocin squeezing your gut and you feel a bit sick and you're busy and all these things. Um, but I, I cut up a watermelon for her um, and fed her that. And that just gave her a little more energy. And then she went upstairs wanting the loo went into her room and the baby was coming yeah. and it just got itself into the right position and that little bit of energy just helped and she just stood by the side of the bed and the baby was coming quite quick so I just got her to lean forward just to slow down the birth a bit and she didn't uh-huh. tear and I just felt like you know all I did really was cut up some watermelon suggest she had a wee and get her to bend over a bit uh-huh. but actually that made quite a lot of difference so yeah that delivery but, but you believed in her as well and you helped yes. her to have that self-belief and and you did that you know without realizing you were doing it just because of of who you are and your your belief in birth mm. and I think that's one of the the biggest gifts you, you can give as a midwife actually I do feel birth in the home is it's just such a different experience for, mm. for women and families and and it just changes the power dynamics doesn't it because you are yeah. now a guest in their home yeah they have the power whereas you know as soon as they step into a hospital they're sort of under the authority or they feel like they're under the authority of, mm. of the hospital you have to like people I think Mm. all kinds of people because you have to be able to find a way to make a connection with somebody quite fast Um, and I think you have to be prepared to tell it how it is Um, not you know be really straight Mm -hmm. about where things are you know people might not always you can't always tell them what they want to hear you have to tell them how it is as far Mm. as you understand it and why that is I think that, that's that, part of it. That's good qualities, yeah. I was going to say um, you have to be very quite patient mm. uh, and also um, be able to um, sort of sit on your hands a bit because, because the, the ideal is if everything's going really well and the woman is well supported, you, you've actually, the least you can interfere, mm. the better. And actually to be able to sort of step back and be an observer but an observer who is ready to act should anything change but I think for people who um who are doers or or who you know like to have everything 
just so or like to be in control that mm. can be quite difficult can't it um yeah so um you know you have got to be able to step into action when it's needed but there's quite long periods of time when actually you are making yourself as invisible as possible to just mm. let nature take its course and to let the support that's already there flourish i think i've learned to do less mm. as i as i've gone on mm-hmm. i i think the newly qualified midwives coming through they're being like we qualified and then we learned to suture we learned to cannulate we learned to do the more advanced baby checks later now they're expected to it's increasingly being expected for people to hit the ground running. I mean, this may all change if, with all the COVID stuff going on, with people having a different perspective about the NHS, this might change. Mm. But generally, I think jobs that junior doctors used to do, we're getting asked to do. Jobs that we used to do, support workers are getting asked to do. So people are getting they're getting trained to do it, but mm. the pay isn't going up in in step with the amount of responsibility Mm -hmm. and it's a way for the NHS to manage the fact that they just don't have enough resources to go round. Mm. so I think I think younger midwives are being asked to do more for less than Mm. we have been I don't know do you think that's a harsh assessment Ali or do you think that's fair uh I think that's fair I think maybe um with the rise in planned cesarean sections and inductions I think some of the more traditional midwifery skills are mm. not um, practiced as much and, and maybe some of the younger newly qualified haven't seen that and mm. learned it so you know they're much, it's well I suppose the way of describing it is it's becoming more medicalized again mm. in, in many ways but yeah I, I don't know. for me I think um I still think it's just the responsibility that, um, and and to a certain extent, there's still a bit of a blame culture. So if something yeah. goes wrong, midwives are genuinely fearful. You know, they they will finish a shift and they'll ring up, wake up at two in the morning, yes. remembering that they forgot to do something, and they'll ring up to say, "Oh no, I didn't do this." You know, and and it's probably something quite insignificant, but. I do think there is a genuine fear that, um, you know, if if you make a mistake, and we are all human, mm. mistakes will happen, um, that you won't always be supported, and especially with sort of litigation and um, mm. that, that sort of thing, that actually uh, people's careers can be blighted. If there's an injury in midwifery, to a baby um, and the trust is found liable and then has to pay, they have to pay for a very long time. So there's very, very few cases where we are found liable, but each one is very expensive. Um, So it's the largest area, or it always was anyway, the largest uh, area of payout for litigation for the NHS. So um, we have massive insurance schemes um, And if you didn't have any of that whole system, I mean, babies can have um, problems with brain damage because of um, losing oxygen in the womb that's nothing to do with labour. And it's really, really hard to know when that damage happened and what what caused it and all that kind of thing. And that's hard for parents as well, not knowing necessarily what caused the problem. Mm. Um, But if you could have no fault compensation so that we just accepted that sometimes this happens... And you just pay for it. The society as a whole just looks after that child when when that happens. I think that, that would help a lot with the blame culture and mm. might even um, stop, you know, say, um, save money overall mm. that could release money away from the insurance um, payments and the and the lawyers and put more back on the on the front line. Mm. Um, but, I mean, you'd, you'd have to do the maths for it, but I think that's one structural change that could maybe make a big difference to how mm. midwifery mm. runs, is if we just, you know, ex- accept it as a society, sometimes it doesn't work um, for whatever reason, 
not very often, but sometimes, and we're going to make sure that those children and those families get looked after without having to go to court to get the resources for it. Mm. It is getting it in perspective because mm. most of the time everything goes really well. The outcome is great. Everyone's happy with it and job done, you know. Um, yeah. You look back and you think that was a really good day at work. And um, it's, it's very, very rare. But obviously, if it does happen, it's catastrophic for the, the people involved. Yeah. The parents especially, but also the staff. And, and that's the trouble. And um, someone, someone said the difference is with pilots, if, um, if something goes wrong, all the senior pilots and everything all die as well, don't they? So there's a real, um, a real drive to sort of for everyone as a team to really work together to, to sort of look at near misses and to really improve mm, mm, uh, mm. because it's you know you only make that mistake once on the whole <laughs> and then <laughs> you know that that's it. Whereas I think in healthcare we um, we perhaps ask the change to happen when we see a system error but because there aren't the resources and there isn't the will um yeah and that's a shame and so yeah I mean I think it is it is a, a minority of times and generally you know there's there's quite a buzz out of handling an emergency well as well I think and, yeah. and often we do mm. you know you just think, you know. I think I think um, with experience as well, I've got a bit a bit better at knowing when to scale up. You know, when I just want one more pair of hands, yeah. And when we look at each other and think, actually, I think we need a room full now, yeah. And and I think just and being able to warn warn the family ahead of time um, that you need those extra people and what you might need them for, and and sometimes they come in and everything's sorted and they just go out again, and mm. you're all right. Mm. You know, it's it's like I think there's there's that's a satisfying thing, and I think we're getting. I mean, one thing I would say about Jessup that I trained at a different hospital, and there there was a real culture of bullying amongst some people. So right. it depended who was coordinating the labour ward. With some people, you really dreaded going on shift. Gosh. Um, but I've never felt like that with Jessup. Like right. I always feel. Um, everybody's looking out for everyone from mm. a, from a staff point of view, yeah. and uh, and if you you ask for help, you're going to get it, yeah. um, and people are going to manage it the best they can. And if if things have gone a bit crazy, we've got busy, really busy. We we try and shed spare, you know, um, oh what is it? Spread that load round yeah. everyone as well, so mm. that people do get a little break for a minute, or somebody hurtles down the corridor with a tray of tea, yeah. you know. Yeah. Just, I remember a anaesthetist, one, one really busy shift, I just gave him a mug of water. He was so grateful for yeah. his mug of water yeah. before he went off, mm. you know. And we shouldn't, I guess we shouldn't be under resourced to the point where we're under that much pressure. But but it is also good that people look out for each other. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It is a, it is a good place to work, isn't it, Al? Yeah, yeah. it is. Mm. I, I, I don't feel, you know... The pressures come from outside the unit, not inside it. Mm. So I guess are, are things okay in the unit? Yeah, um, they are really. I mean, it's a bit, it's mad with all the PPE and the different ways of working. That's kind mm. of tiring and stressful. But um, as from a staff point of view, and um, we haven't had a lot of women in ill so far. So, you know, it's been yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Are you working off? Because Hillary was saying um, they were co she was coming off of research onto um, onto the postnatal wards. Yeah, bit. yeah, she has. But we, we've been um, we've had to train like a lot of the gynae nurses have come to work on labour wards. So we've had to, to sort of help them get settled in and train them in some of the maternity uh -huh. things. So we've been, you know, helping out, but not had to fully take up the mantle yet. So. Well, when this is over, we'll have to meet up for a cup of tea. That would be lovely. We will do that. That would be great. Yeah. And Martin, you're welcome too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, that was absolutely fascinating to hear from two people whose profession has since been lost to the mists of time, as, in fact, has the introduction from the Curries to the next segment. So I guess I'll take it. And now we go over to the boogie-woogie curate himself, Hugh Thomas, with Thought for the Day. 
having chatted last week about Easter bonnocks, this week I find myself thinking about sin and guilt. Ooh, uh. I was delighted in 2017 when the BBC finally axed Crime Watch. That programme featured reconstructed crimes and photo fits of suspects that the police were after. And the problem was many of those photo fits, they were bald, they were bearded, they were haggard. They basically looked like me. With one of them, even I was sat there thinking, ooh, where was I on the evening of April the 5th? I almost rang the BBC to say, well, I'm sure I, I'm sure I was at evening prayer, but, you know, looking at the artist's impression, I don't think I've got a leg to stand on. That guilty feeling of being picked out, it can be horrible. One troubling thing I've noticed in this time called lockdown is the way it's brought out our tendency to be narky and judgmental. And while I'm all for stay at home and support the NHS, I'm also all for us being a bit gentler in the assumptions we make about the lives and behaviour and motives of others. What can look like somebody breaking the rule, maybe with good reason, or it may just be a response to the pressure. Remember the saying, never criticise someone until you've walked a mile in their shoes. Of course, at that point, when you do criticise them, you're a good safe mile away. And if they come after you, you've got shoes and they haven't. But that's another matter. A healthy perception of doing wrong, sin, if you like, has more to do with kindness and understanding that we all make mistakes than with judgment and condemnation and tweets and posts on social media. And that gentleness that grace. That then goes as much for ourselves as for how we regard others. You home educating parents struggling with the spellings and the like, you need to be a bit gentler on yourselves. To love your neighbour as you love yourself. You do need to love yourself quite a bit, you know. I mean, we've all got our own struggles at this time and during normal life. We've all got our own cupboards that we hide in, but looked at it this way, we may just be a bit gentler with those who just happen to do a different no-nos to the no-no that we do. Having said that, I am looking at that shoplifter from Dagenham in 1998, and I am thinking, you know, it's a fair cop. It's really interesting to hear about how people used to think, because of course, back then they had to use their squishy organic brains rather than our new shiny chrome ones. So, um, I mean, I imagine the processing speed was a lot slower, but I, I do think uh, there's a certain vintage charm in it. Anyway, on to the next segment. So, what do you know about the next segment? Well, Martin, I can tell you that the next segment is going to be some great, inspiring, very non-specific stuff. Do carry on telling me about it. I would, Martin, but I really just don't want to take away from your amazing radio skills in introducing this very next segment. Well, actually, I haven't heard it yet. Well, Martin, welcome to the boat, because I have never heard a single segment on this show, and it's never stopped me, so you go ahead. OK. Lee, I wonder what you're giving us. Let's find out. Hello, my name's Lee Moore. I am producer and co-host of True Storytelling Show, Tales of Whatever. Today I'd like to tell you a true story about a damp field in Cheshire and the post-rock band Sigur Ross. When it comes to falling in love with somebody, Hollywood movies have taught us that often... It's one earth-shattering moment that makes you realise that. I've never particularly thought that. I've always thought it's a series of moments that build together. But what do I know? I want to talk about an afternoon, evening, back in 2013. My girlfriend at the time and I decided to go to the Blue Dot Festival, which is a music festival held in the shadow of Jodrell Bank. And uh, I was particularly excited because my favourite band, Sigur Rós, an Icelandic uh, post-rock band, were headlining. Now, if you're not familiar with Sigur Rós, they play music quite similar to uh, what you can hear playing under this story. And they're capable of some of the most astonishingly beautiful music you'll ever hear. But they are a bit weird. Uh, the lead singer, partic in particular, has a quite unusual falsetto voice. And they are an acquired taste. But the day went well. The undercard bands were grey. It was a lovely sunny day and we were having a really good time. Then, as the day went on and Sigur Rós started, uh, it started to cloud over, get a bit colder. Then, as Sigur Rós are playing, it starts to rain. Not heavily, just a light smattering of rain that just fills the air. And for me, it, I didn't mind. 
uh, I was really enjoying the music, really enjoying the performance. And then as the light faded, the, they started playing a song that I've always known as Untitled Number Three. Quite an unusual song, but it is beautiful. And the rain suddenly started to get a bit heavier. And I didn't know why all of a sudden this moment was really important. It was really important to me that Rod's my girlfriend, liked Sigaross. I don't know why, but that, you know, that we were sharing this moment and I wanted it to be something that we were both enjoying. As the song started to build, the rain got heavier and it was just filling, sort of filling the air. And then suddenly to the right of the, of the, sort of the field where the concert was happening, there was a break in the clouds and a blaze of sunshine blasted across the field and turned all the rain that was still falling into shining diamonds. It was like the air was filled with diamonds and it was one of the most indescribably beautiful moments I've ever experienced. But I couldn't turn to look at Roz because objectively it's strange, <laughs> really strange. But objectively she could have been standing there thinking I'm standing in a wet field, it's raining, I'm listening to a guy with a really weird voice. What is this? Who wisely brought me here? And so I couldn't look and sort of as the moment continued I thought oh, I have to, I have to. I don't know why it was important but it was. And I, and I turned and I looked and Roz was lost in the music and there was tears pouring down, pouring down her face. And I thought, yeah, I think this is the person I want to be with. And not too long after that, we got married and we're still married now. And I often think back to that moment as being such a key moment sort of in our lives. So maybe Hollywood movies are onto something. And that's my true story. Uh, if you enjoyed that, um, I, as I say, I'm um, producer and co-host of Tales or Whatever. We're putting out a weekly show on YouTube where... We ask a variety of performers, often mainly comedians, to record a true story. Uh, they are free to watch and you can donate at uh, ko-fi.com forward slash tales or whatever. And if you go to our YouTube channel, uh, if you just type in uh, tales, tales or whatever YouTube, you'll get there. And we've got four shows up there at the moment with a new one every week. Thank you very much. I wasn't expecting that. Neither was I. What can I say? That was a great segment on the show by Lee. Yeah. Well, Martin, now that we've heard from Lee, I've got a question on my mind. You have a question on your mind? I have a question on my mind. Let me remove that question. Well, Martin, we've heard about, you know, news from Lee. We've heard from Ben Boardman. We've heard from the Allisons. We've heard from Hugh. But have you heard any news from nowhere? <laughs> That's really smooth. That's what they call a segue. What can I say? I'm a radio pro. This is actually uh, Ingrid's last visit with the news from nowhere. Uh, she's wrapping up the final few chapters and then we're moving on to something else next week. I'm not sure what it is yet, but uh, knowing Ingrid, it'll be something highly scholarly. The news from nowhere? More like the news from... Coming up now. So in the new world of nowhere, all this is done away with in a great revolution known as the change, which old Hammond outlines again in great detail. Uh, the ways in which it comes about, the way in which people change and the, and the workers gradually band together so that they can resist the violence of the state. Um, and out of which there's a new society, new ways of communal working and distinctions of class and wealth are now unknown. At the end of his detailed account of the revolution, old Hammond notes... In short, the two combatants, the workman and the gentleman, between them, between them, said I quickly, they destroyed commercialism. Yes, 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 said he, that is it. Nor could it have been destroyed otherwise, except perhaps by the whole of society gradually falling into lower depths till it should at last reach a condition as rude as barbarism. Surely the short, shorter, sharper remedy was the happiest. Most surely, said I. Interesting use of barbarism there, because usually for Morris, barbarism is actually something good. Barbarism is a state in which the sort of unreality of what he calls civilization uh, is stripped away and people see the realities of relationships between them. Yes, said the old man, the world was being brought to its second birth. How could that take place without a tragedy? Moreover, think of it. And here's a beautiful moment in the text, which is really important to the way in which Morris um, imagines a, a future world. The spirit of the new days, of our days, was to be delight in the life of the world, intense and overweening love of the very skin and surface of the earth on which man dwells, such as a lover has in the fair flesh of the woman he loves. 
such a great description of the relationship between the people and earth. Although, of course, Morris's own particular preoccupation with female beauty um, is in evidence there. So machine-made wares no longer exist and people make crockery, furniture and other goods by hand. And again, Morris's emphasis on the combination of beauty and utility comes into play. And, and, and the only sort of shadow in that world of work uh, is present because there's a kind of slight fear of a work famine. What do we do if we've all got enough and we don't want to make more wares? Maybe there'll come a point when there just isn't work to do. That's a kind of slight anxiety in the text. So again, always there's the possibility of future change, future transformation. This is not a world in which anything is ever completely static. And I think that's partly how Morris gets over um, that question of how do you make sort of peaceful, happy existence um, exciting in a text, that potential for future change. So in the course of conversation with old Hammond, um, Clara and Dick, remember them, the young lovers, ex-partners now getting back together, return. And so Dick and old Hammond and Guest uh, all have dinner together in beauty and harmony um, in another beautiful hall. By chapter 21, the exposition and describing of how the world works and how it came about is all over. And Clara, Dick and Guest say goodbye to old Hammond and set off on their expedition up the River Thames, passing some lovely fragrant trees as they go along in which the scent of lime blossom is discernible, we're told. So this great kind of sensory world is um, present again once uh, Guest is out of the British Museum. Their first stop along the way is at a cottage where they meet and are then joined on the journey by the lovely Ellen, uh, a country girl who's nonetheless dressed in beautiful silk. She lives with her grandfather, the old grumbler, who says to guess, well, sir, I'm happy to see a man from over the water, but I really must appeal to you to say whether on the whole you're not better off in your country, where I suppose from what our guest says you are brisker and more alive because you've not wholly got rid of competition. You see, I've read not a few books of the past days, and certainly they are much more alive than those which are written now. And good, sound, unlimited competition was the condition under which they were written. So the young'un's kind of grown at his ideas. He's known as the old grumbler. They've grown at his love of books, which you remember are not very popular in this world. But nonetheless, his voice is allowed to be heard. And this is significant in this utopia. This utopia does not exist by dint of shutting out everyone who disagrees with it. There's room in this world for grumblers and dissenters. Um, and although some might notice the fact that Dick kind of says in a side to guess, yeah, these old grumblers used to be a real nuisance and there's still a few of them left. So we have the sense that these voices of dissent are kind of dying out, which may or may not be a good thing. The text insists nonetheless on the continued presence of these kinds of people who don't follow the general uh, sense of the way in which society works. Later on in the journey, invited to join in with a hay harvest to which everyone is flocking, men and women, by the way, joining in with work, just as Ellen joins in with rowing, looking delightful as she does so, of course, just as Dick looks delightful in what we're told is his manly beauty, on which Clara gazes while he rows. Um, so while they're going along uh, and people are flocking to the uh, hay harvest, they meet the obstinate refusers, a group of workers who are busy doing their own work, carving low reliefs on the wall of the house. And they refuse to join in with the hay harvest because they say, no, we've lost a lot of time. Um, the leader of our group of carvers, Philippa, has been ill for a little while. Again, that note of imperfection. She's now returned to work. It's gone a little bit slower, so we need to just get on with it. Philippa stops very briefly to say hello to them and then kind of goes, look, guys, I've got to get on with my work. So as with the approach to the errors of friends, the obstinate refusers, like the old grumbler, are accepted with a kind of wry amusement, but they have a place in this society. Another stop on the journey brings the foursome to the house of Walter Allen, who tells them the tale of a man who attacked his rival for a woman's love and was killed in the fight. He's been shunned by the community, advised to go away on his own and cool down. And the assumption is that he'll come back after a while and be reinstated into fellowship once he's kind of had time to reflect on his behaviour and change. I listened to this story with much surprise, says Guest in another lovely moment of understatement. The journey on the Thames continues and there's a, a, a lot of beautiful accounts of trees and birds as they go on. There's this sense of human life and natural life increasingly uh, becoming one. 
At one point, Guest says, I may mention as a detail worth noting that not only did there seem to be a great many more birds about of the non-predatory kinds, but their enemies, the birds of prey, were also commoner. Again, important. This isn't a world in which everything is just sort of sweet and cloying. A kite hung over our heads as we passed Medmenham yesterday. Magpies were quite common in the hedgerow. I saw several sparrow hawks and I think a merlin. And now just as we were passing the pretty bridge which had taken the place of Basildon Railway Bridge, a couple of ravens croaked above our boat as they sailed off to the higher ground of the downs. The journey continues to its end. Guest, rather predictably, falling in love with Ellen as they progress along the river. She, in turn, talks to him a little bit about her troubled relationships. I have troubled men's minds disastrously, she says, uh, rather sweetly. And we have the sense that Guest really doesn't mind her troubling his. And he's getting to think that he might really quite enjoy uh, his mind being troubled by Ellen. When the journey uh, comes to its end, they arrive at a beautiful old house, um, just outside Oxford, with elm trees and sweet chestnuts and willows right down to the riverbank. The blackbirds, we're told, were singing their loudest. The doves were cooing on the roof ridge. The rooks in the high elm trees were beyond, uh, and the rooks in the high elm trees beyond were garrulous among the young leaves. And the swifts wheeled, whining about the gables. And the house itself was a fit guardian for all the beauty of this heart of summer. And the house. It, we're also told has a wonderful garden. This, of course, is the garden that Morris himself has tended and the landscape with which he's deeply familiar. So again, the human and the natural world interconnecting. Note the way that, you know, the uh, the rooks are garrulous. So there's that kind of sense of them talking, saying a lot, the noises as well as the smells and the sights of nature um, inform um, the world increasingly. Um, as Guest goes along the river and as they arrive at its end. Guest notices as well as they come close to the house. Presently, we saw before us a bank of elm trees, which told us of a house amidst them, though I looked in vain for the grey walls that I expected to see there. So that's a little moment where Morris is going, ah, Guest is me. He's looking for the walls of my house, but they're not there because there are no walls around the house in this world. As we went, the folk on the bank talked indeed, mingling their kind voices with the cuckoo's song, the sweet, strong whistle of the blackbirds and the ceaseless note of the corncrake as he crept through the long grass of the mowing field, whence came the waves of fragrance from the flowering clover amidst of the ripe grass. It's one of the moments I love in the book, that moment of the idea of people mingling their kind voices with the cuckoo's song and the blackbird. What a lovely idea of kind of interspecies communication. Ellen lays her hand on the old house and she says in evidence of what old Hammond had said about how people love the earth, oh me, oh me, how I love the earth and the seasons and weather and all things that deal with it and all that grows out of it, as this has done. So she is seeing the house itself and its old uh, stone as a kind of outgrowth of the earth. And that's another uh, of Morris's preoccupations, the way in which um, architecture uh, needs to be in keeping with the landscape. So they go on to the great house and the others go in to begin the evening feast. And as they go in, Morris stands on the threshold, uh, hoping to um, join them. And just as he thinks Dick is about to turn round and invite him, he realises that they're starting to fade before his very eyes. And uh, just before he's arrived there on that threshold, he's seen for the first time a kind of poor looking worker. So we get the idea that this world is somehow now fading from um, guests' reality. And that this is the very last few words of the book, which I'm going to read in their entirety. All along, though those friends were so real to me, I had been feeling as if I had no business amongst them, as though the, as though the time would come when they would reject me and say, as Ellen's last mournful look seemed to say, no, it will not do. You cannot be of us. You belong so entirely to the unhappiness of the past that our happiness even would weary you. Go back again now you have seen us and your outward eyes have learned that in spite of all the infallible maxims of your day, there is yet a time of rest in store for the world when mastery has changed into fellowship, but not before. Go back again then, and while you live, you will see all around you people engaged in making others live lives which are not their own, while they themselves care nothing for their own real lives. Men who hate life though they fear death. Go back and be the happier for having seen us, for having added a little hope to your struggle. Go on living while you may, striving with whatsoever pain and labour needs must be, to build up little by little the new day of fellowship and rest 
and happiness. Yes, surely, and if others can see it as I have seen it, then it may be called a vision rather than a dream. And that's the end of News From Nowhere. This is the Stuckat Home Service. <laughs> In the virtual open mic, which we featured last week, and this song just caught my attention. I thought it was really nice, and um, I asked his permission. And uh, here's his song. It's uh, say Frank T. Watkinson, and you might hear his dog interrupting him towards the end of it. But um, it doesn't bark; it just snuffles around a bit. It, I think it's time it went out. All right. Here's Frank. <laughs> Every time I hear the soft harp sing, my heart jumps in my breast, my love, my heart jumps in my breast, and until I hear your footsteps coming, this heart can know no rest. Now it's time for my favourite segment, and I know it's yours too, Back Chat, where we use our incredible technology to actually ring the subjects of this podcast, confusing the hell out of them. Without further ado, let's go. I apologise, listeners, my phone's ringing. Mm. 
It's just because I'm don't such a talk like. About your phone ringing. It's just because I'm such like a cool guy and like I'm really casual. I find I pick up the phone. Hello, you've rung into the stuck at home service. How can I help you? Oh, that's absolutely fantastic. That is exactly where I was trying to ring. Uh, I take it you are Frankie Curry. That's me. You're on speakerphone, Martin. It's our first call in. Look, can can you just take this phone call elsewhere and I'll Martin? The it's program. for the show. What, what, okay, whatever. Look, I think you might want to hear this, uh, Elder Curry. Um, Elder Curry. My name is Paula Peterson. I am ringing from the year twenty one twenty. Oh my God. Martin, it's like I said, it's like how in the beginning of the show I was talking about how this podcast was going to be used as a historical record, and now at the end of the show, I'm referencing that, and if you think about it, she's doing the same thing, but from way in the future. Yes. Which means I'm right, I'm a genius! He has it right. What, 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 yeah, sorry, I don't believe a word of it. Uh, Could you take this phone call elsewhere? I'll I'll wrap up the show and, um... Alright, Paula, we have a lot to talk about. People love me in the future, right? Oh, absolutely. You are remembered with adoration. All right, I'm going to take take this phone call in another room. See you in a minute, Martin. Goodbye, Elder Curry. Bye. Wrap up the show without me, okay? Yeah, okay. How's it going? Wow, Okay, listeners, uh, however many there are of you, I'm I'm grateful for you, and uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, Sorry about the nonsense that went on this week. Okay, all right, bye. What is the deal with airline food? That's enough, that's enough. Love, like we've never loved before.